When is free really not free? When, when is it not free? Right? Have you, ever, have you ever downloaded an app and you were super excited about it? Right? Free app. It's free, right? And you get on there only to find out what? It, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Stuart. It, it's not free at all. Like you get excited, you're going to get a golfing magazine. You get on there and the app is absolutely free. You can get on the app. You just can't read anything unless you buy it, right? Kind of like a golf magazine or some of the other things. It's not really free. And so this morning what we're going to look at is when is free, free? When is it truly free? So this morning as we look at this, if you have an image of what is, what's your image of freedom? This was mine. I saw it this week and it reminded, doesn't that look like our pastor? Like just really enjoying himself on vacation and the water and you know, it looks just like him and I love the image. It almost looks like a cross underneath him. It's just beautiful. And so I'm not venerating him, by the way. He's not a saint. He's not even dead yet. So, but anyway, <laughs> but, but it, it's one, I, I, have, I have images of freedom. In America, some of us have images of freedom. For my mama, it was the Statue of Liberty. She kind of placed in my heart this, this love for the Statue of Liberty and what it represented in America. And we're in this 4th of July weekend. And we have these images of freedom However, the Christian image of freedom has never shifted. It's never shifted. And that image of freedom today, as we look at it, the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 5 addresses an issue that's really difficult. Because like this app, like this app that you get into it and you realize that it's not free, the church in Galatia had an app swap. They had some folks that came into the church and said, you know what, yeah, relationship with Jesus Christ, it's, it's free but not free. It's free but we're going to add some additional things. So the Apostle Paul, not pulling any punches, wanted to tell them right up front because the entire book is about justification, about how we are justified in Jesus Christ And he's trying to combat these folks that have come into the church. And I was reminded by Pastor Frank, some of those folks considered themselves pillars of the church. Ed Paul in chapter 2 didn't pull any punches with them. But the Apostle Paul planted churches, particularly on his first missionary journey. And he left Jewish, when he left, Jewish Christians came in and they said this, pretty much. That Jesus, that Jesus app that you downloaded for free, well, it only works if you pay up. It only works if you wrap it into Judaism. And they were called Judaizers. Because they came in to take advantage of those Christians. You have to keep the Jewish law. It's Jesus and the Jewish law. Jesus is good, but he's just not enough. Kind of a a real challenge, isn't it? So if you bought into something, you signed up for something, and you realized that, look, it's not really free. That's what the people in the church were saying. That's what many of them were trying to push on the church. The gospel, friends, is done, not due. Let me say that again. The gospel of Jesus Christ is done. It is finished. It's not due. We live by grace alone in Jesus Christ. It's done and not due. Christ finished the work. The Apostle Paul is expressing this incredible frustration that these Judaizers have come in and they brought confusion and they brought with them the pay to play. And we all know what that means, the pay to play. That yeah, you can be in the church and yes, you can have this. It is through Jesus, but not really. So you, in, 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 in chapter 5, he begins to talk about why it's so important because he says, you, you come in knowing Jesus, but now you want to add circumcision. Now you got to get circumcised. Now you got to do this rule. Now you got to follow this thing. And Paul is saying, that's not how you came into this. That's not what you were promised through me. That's not what took place when I came. Amen? And this morning, this 4th of July weekend, we're going to go camping. You're going to go camping with me this morning. And we're going to camp in chapter 5 of Galatians, and we're going to dabble. In, in, we're going to put our feet in the river or the lake of chapter 3 this morning. 
We're going to unpack that in Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for our time together. In our short time, this is going to be one of the, this is shorter than one of Brooke Mars camping trips. Lord, help us to have a great time this morning. Amen and amen. And we're not, it's not a two-day thing. We're just going to be in here for about 30 minutes this morning. Finding our freedom to Christ is the title of the message this morning. Some years ago, we had a woman come into the church, and she was really new. And we were talking about salvation, and I was talking to her about Jesus, and talking about faith in Jesus Christ. And of course, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 came in, for by grace are you saved through faith. That, salvation not of itself, is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone can boast. And I'm talking to her about what does that mean to follow Jesus? What does it mean to be a Jesus follower? What is true justification by faith in Jesus mean? What does that mean? Jesus only. Jesus. Freedom. Right? And, and at talking to her, she had an incredible stumbling block that came in as we were talking. And that stumbling block was, and maybe you've heard this before, someone has said to you, it can't be that easy. Just putting my faith in Jesus, just believing that he died and rose again, believing that if I turn away from my old life and say, I'm going to walk this direction and I'm going to begin to walk, it can't be that easy. There's got to be something more. And as I dug down deeper with her, she began to talk about in her life all the things that she had done. You don't realize, you don't know what I've done. And she began to build this case that in no way the work of Jesus Christ could somehow cover her. And I, in my tactfulness, it, 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 I, I began to talk to her about, listen, what you're truly saying, what you are saying to me is that Jesus, your, your sin is bigger than Jesus' sacrifice. Whew. You're saying your sin, yours alone, that he died on the cross for all sin. For all of us who would receive that, you're saying that yours is so much bigger than anybody else's. Bigger than the Apostle Paul who said, I'm the chief among sinners because I have butchered his people. I've led them to the slaughter before he came to his own Jesus time, Jesus moment. And I started to speak to her, talk to her about it. And you know, she never got through that. In fact, she left here and she went to another church, a Mormon church. And she talked to me later and said, they've given me things I need to do that I must do to be saved. So it wasn't enough. Jesus wasn't enough. And I said to her, you will find out someday that, guess what, that Jesus is enough. And that's a really stark example, right? That's a stark example. That's a big example in someone's life. But as we're going to see this morning, we can allow that mission creep, that mission creep of legalism and our view of salvation to become distorted. Distorting the work of Jesus Christ. And this is the same dilemma, the same trap that the people in Galatia had fallen into. This pay-to-play salvation. In the second in the second to the last chapter of this letter to the church in Galatia, Paul tackles this pernicious lie of pay-to-play salvation. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. We're going to look at it this morning. We have it up here. If you need it up here this morning, or turn in your, or actually turn on your phone. I hope it's a free Bible app that will actually let you get to Galatians 5, right? It is for freedom, for freedom that Christ has set us free. Doesn't that sound really strange? It's for freedom that you were set free. I think it's going to become self-explanatory in a little bit as we begin to unpack this on our little camping trip. It's going to become, there's going to be this awareness of why Paul is using this double kind of, it's for freedom that Christ has set you free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. It's a cry for freedom. When some think of freedom, they think of, you know, the violence of the French Revolution. They may think of the wonderful U.S. founders and their documents and their principles that this country was founded on. But let me tell you, 1,700 years, 1,700-ish years earlier, the Apostle Paul, at the climactic end of this great epistle, 
said this, made this great declaration. It is for freedom that Christ Jesus has set us free. It is the Christian cry for liberty, for Christian freedom, for it is for freedom, the purpose of the Christian freedom that we have in Him. That leads us to the big question this morning. Here's the big question. What is Christian freedom? What does it really liberate me from? And what does it liberate me into or call me to as a Christian? Because we're liberated from, but we're also liberated and free for. For this purpose, for this purpose, freedom has been set free. For this purpose, we have freedom in Christ. It is for freedom that we have been set free. Stand firm, therefore. And this cry for freedom in Paul's letter, there are two distinct facets that we're going to look at quickly this morning. Two distinct facets. Paul's idea of Christian freedom. The first Christian freedom that we see this morning is freedom from. Freedom from. The first half of this verse, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Builds later, Galatians 5, 13 through 6, 10. And the freedom of the Christian life. So if you're looking at the first part of verse 1, it's leading into verses 13 through 6.10. Chapter 6, verse 10. It's a freedom that Paul wants to be able to tell them. This is why God set you free. This is the purpose that he set you free. God is purposeful, purposeful and intentional in our life in setting us free. Amen? Purposeful and intentional. So the first half... He starts out as for freedom that he has set us free. And he begins to talk about, verses 1 through 4, he talks about the freedom that God does not want us to walk in, which is no freedom at all. And that is being entangled with the law again. Because some had come in in verse 3, 2 and 3 and 4, begin to talk about the legalism that that came in. Yes, you're saved by Jesus, but you must get circumcised. And Paul says circumcision does nothing for you because you can't get entangled to the law. The purpose of the law in all of the Old Testament, the purpose of the law was to do one thing was to point you to Jesus Christ, to show your need for a Savior, that you're fallen, that we are are sinful, and we need the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. In His death and resurrection, and having faith in that, brings salvation. It plants eternity in our heart now, and eternity for later. It is that freedom from, freedom from the law, freedom from the pay to play. It wasn't until 15 years ago. I came to Christ early in my life. Uh, I, I think I've told this story. The Baptist bust me in, I think, at 10 or 11. And I ended up giving my heart to Christ and then really, really began to serve the Lord in my ninth grade year. And there was such a liberty and freedom in coming to Jesus Christ, coming from my background, coming from where I was at. There, I was so elated with my sins forgiven in that understanding of what God has done, filled me with His Holy Spirit, did incredible things. But over the years, something began to happen in my life. And it wasn't until 15 years ago that I began to recognize what was taking place. And slowly but surely, the mission creep, right? The law began to come in. The idea that I must be perfect before God. The law that came in, the abuse that began to take in, in my heart. I lived in fear as a pastor that I wasn't good enough. I lived in fear as a pastor and as a man of God that I, that I wasn't good enough as a father, that I wasn't good enough as a husband. Nothing began to match up. Nothing began to be good enough for me. It wasn't that I just was dissatisfied. But legalism had come in, and I felt like I just couldn't please my Father God. I couldn't please Him. It was never good enough until one one week I was studying Galatians 5 and going back to chapter 3 and looking through this, and something began to happen. You know what? I was like that dog that kept returning to its kennel. You know the dog that's been abused? You open the kennel, you drag him out, you say, you're free. You don't need that anymore. You don't have to go back in that anymore. A dog that's been abused. 
And you know what a dog that's been abused does? Or a dog that's under the law? A dog that's under a taskmaster? A dog that's under its owner? That has been mean to it? Cruel to it? Right? That's not the intention of Father God. You pull it out of the kennel and what does it want to do? It wants to go back in because it's the only thing it knows. The only thing it knows. During 9-11, you would not believe the number of believers that went back to their old life, went back to old habits. You would not believe the exponential, exponentially more amount of people, the greater numbers of people that during COVID, the very same thing, very same thing, not good enough, can't be good enough. These verses obliterated my kennel. It totally smashed and obliterated my kennel so that I would never go back to that again. I would never live in that fear. Perfect love casts out all fear. God is not, Paul told Timothy, God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Love broke that false image of my father, Father God. You hear me sometimes pray, Papa God. That's when that term came into my life, was that week. Papa God. Father was something different to me. Papa. Papa. Papa God, the one who loves me. The one that says I'm good enough. The one that puts me on his spiritual shoulders and says, I love you. I love you so much, I, I dance over you. Isn't that incredible? In verses 1 through 8 of Galatians and 7 and 8 and Galatians 3, 1 through 3, they just, it was so incredible what God did. But you know what? I had no problem applying that to other people's life during that time. I would, I would counsel and talk to other people that were harsh on themselves right? And I would talk to them and tell them, look, you're free from the law. This is not what God thinks about you. But secretly, myself, I lived in that. I lived in that. I lived with that. Back into the bondage of the law. Galatians 7 and 8 that I just spoke of says this. You were running well. You were running well. Who hindered you? And that in that Greek, in the Greek language, that original word hinder means who beat you back. Literally, who got in your running path, your lane, and beat you back? Who pushed you back in your spiritual walk to a place that you began to depend upon your own works again? Who invaded your life in such a way? That you stopped your forward momentum in Jesus and you froze. And you know why you froze? Because you can never be perfect enough. You can never, ever be good enough. And that's why Father God, Papa God sent Jesus. Amen? So you are good enough. Amen? Who beat you back from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from Him. Who calls you? Who? Not from him who calls you. In fact, in Galatians 3, Paul addresses it this way. Oh, foolish Galatians. And you can even put, I put my own name there that week. Oh, foolish Tommy. Don't ever call me that. I hate it. Oh, foolish Tommy. Who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus was publicly portrayed and crucified. In fact, the word says in one place that Jesus took the enemy and he paraded him buck naked before the world. That's really what it means. You know why? Because when a man is naked, you know that they hold no weapons against you. And he's basically saying the enemy of our soul has no weapons that can work. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. No way, no how. You foolish. And he says, who bewitched you? So not only did they get in your way, but they did what? They changed your mind about how God works in your life. That it's by grace and by faith. 
And it's through love that we have come to him. Who bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus was crucified publicly. You saw what God did. It was finished. It was done. In verse 2 of Galatians 3, he says, Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the spirit of works of the law or by hearing with faith? He said, how did you begin? You heard the message of the gospel and you had faith and you believed and you allowed these Judaizers to come in and stop your progression. Stop your forward movement in me. You allowed them to do what? Bewitch your mind. Twist things up in your head. You ever, you ever been with somebody that can argue really well? Right? That just can, you, you start talking to them and you believe, you believe what you're saying and then they start talking and then you forget what, you're even, what your point even was. He says, who are these people that did this to you? Don't allow them to hinder your race, your walk with him. And then, and then he says, verse 3 of Galatians 3, are you so foolish? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected in the flesh? Whoo! Walk in freedom. Walk in the Spirit. He, in chapter 5, he, he eventually gets there to walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Begin in the Spirit. Christ's work is enough. It's you're not giving yourself this, this free pass, this greasy grace to do whatever you want because we serve him and we love him and we want to please our Lord and Savior. But is that legalism, that addition that speaks to you, that says in your ears, in your mind, you're not good enough. You begin in the spirit and really in the flesh, in the flesh, you can't make it happen. Because you can never be good enough. I, I, I love Dr. Anthony Evans, Tony Evans. Anybody ever heard him preach? He gave the most powerful illustration on this that I've ever seen. Anybody remember Carl Lewis? Carl Lewis was the long jumper that was the world champion. I think it was 2311 or 23, something like that. And it was just amazing how far he could leap. And he says, imagine for yourself that you have this huge lake that's like two miles wide. And you have this dock. And you go, okay, let's see how far we can jump. And so Carl Lewis runs and he, he gets a good one. He, he's out, because of the dock, he's like out 26 feet in, right, into the water. 26 feet towards the other side of the lake. I get up there in my best, my prime years. And I run and jump, and let's just say I, I get 12 feet. 12 feet. Man, compared to Carl Lewis, I'm nothing, right? I'm nothing. But then you pull back, and you get this Google image of the lake, the entire lake. And you see the dock. And then you see how far Carl Lewis got to the other side. And then you see how far Tom Freisinger got to the other side. And you look and you go, you know what? Not much difference. You got two miles. Nobody is good enough. Hmm. Isn't that the point? That day in my office, I was looking through the scripture and these scriptures were just really weighing on me and beginning to get inside me. You know, when they begin to start to make a change. And I started listening to Keith Green. And I don't know why I went back there, but I think it was because of my early days of salvation. Keith was a big deal. He was a Christian artist. And, and I remember when I first got saved, I was living in a home where my parents didn't know Jesus, didn't, didn't follow Jesus. My mom had, uh, she had an experience with Jesus Christ, but really that just didn't go much farther than that. And at the top of our stairs in Bothell, Washington, I, in Queensgate, I, that's my closet. It was, the, it was the laundry closet. And that's where I'd go into for hours, and I would listen 
to Keith Green and I would pray and pray in the dark, pray out loud by myself. I had no, very little support. And I, began, and I began to listen to this song when I hear the praises start. And I just remember breaking down and just saying, I can't do this. I can't be what everybody else wants me to be. I can't even be what I think I should be, where I think I should be. And I'm beginning to listen to this song. And the words go, my son, my son, why are you striving? You can't add one thing to what's been done for you. I did it all while I was dying. Rest in your faith. My peace will come to you. And I just began to weep. And I remember I ran, ran into the sanctuary and I threw myself on the floor and I just began to weep. And God did this incredible, incredible thing in my heart. And I just remember getting up and realizing the kennel's gone, the cage is gone, and the draw and the pull of the law has been broken. In all of our lives, it doesn't matter whether you're a pastor or who you are, you go through those moments in your life as a believer where God begins to do a new and a deeper thing in you, where you're not the same, where he brings some catastrophe, some major event in your life. You come to some point in your life when you realize you're trying to do it all on your own and you can't. You're not going to fix it all on your own. You're not going to change it all on your own. But there's one who will walk with you who will never leave you or forsake you. Amen? I got up from there and I was a different person. It was done, not do anymore. God had done it all. And you know what? I still walked with God and realized I want to do great things for him. But here was the difference. I was doing it out of love for him, but not the law. The law was dead in my life. And you said, but you were a pastor for 20 years. Yeah, I know that. And that's just the point. You know, we often look at TV programs and we wonder, how could the Pharisees actually be like that, right? And then you go, religion can sneak in to anybody's walk. The law can creep in to anybody's walk. Amen? Blow up the kennel. Get rid of the cage today. Walk in freedom. The second aspect is freedom for. So freedom from the law. Freedom from the law and its, and its abuse and its mastery. I was free from the law of sin and death and hell. I was free from living in fear of hell. That wasn't it. But I was bound. But I was free for what? Free for what? The second half of this verse that tells us to stand to stand and not go again into the slavery of sin, begins to capture the idea that God has something more for us. And, and the reason that word stand therefore is there because of the idea that, that, that the enemy has been buffeting you with the law. And he's saying withstand it. Withstand it. Because you're going to break through. And when you do break through, there's going to be a four in your life. Freedom four. Freedom for. And we see that in chapter 2, 16 through chapter 4, 7. We get this idea of the full acceptance with God. The only way is by faith in Jesus Christ. Freedom for is found in verses 5 and 6. Freedom for is found for one thing. It's found through that one word, that one powerful word. Freedom for loving and serving others. We're freedom for love. We're fleet free to express love to God and love to others. Right? We're, freedom, we're free to put others first. We're free to do what? Not to do, live our life just for ourselves. Working in love. Look at verse 5. Let it speak for itself. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only, only 
faith working through, there's that four-letter word, love. Only faith working through love. We are set free so that our faith in Jesus Christ will help us express the greatest love that has ever existed, the unconditional love of Jesus Christ. But if we don't feel that in ourselves, and if we're not free from the law, it's going to be really hard to what? To be free for serving others through love. Because it's all about ourselves, all about us not living up to it, all about us trying to hit some imaginary spiritual mark. Accounts counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Look at verse 13. For you were called to freedom. Only do not use your, here it is, your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. That's what he's saying. You were free, but don't use that opportunity for the flesh. It is for freedom that you were set free. So you were set free so you could serve others through love. You were set free not to use that freedom, what? For your own self. In fact, the Apostle Paul says, you know what? There are things that I can do. There's a lot of things I could do, but there's no spiritual benefit in it. There's a lot of freedom that I have, but I choose not to use that freedom for selfish ambition. I choose not to use that freedom in for myself and for myself only. There's a lot of things that that are okay, but they're not beneficial because they're not expressing love through service to others. For you are called to freedom. Don't use that freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Use it for loving your family, serving your spouse, serving your children, your grandchildren, for serving others. Freedom is to love and to serve. Doesn't that, doesn't that seem backwards? Well, in fact, Jesus said it very much the same thing. He said, if you want to be first, be the servant of all, right? If you, want to, if you want to be first, then be last, right? You want to serve. And it, it, is in, it is in line with what Jesus spoke about. Use that freedom for serving others in love. Use that freedom for doing good to all, especially the household of faith. It's consistent throughout. We've been free from the law of sin and death. And we're free for serving God. I choose to serve him out of my heart. I choose to love as Jesus loved. That's my freedom. Because selfishness says, what about my point? What about my argument with my spouse? What about my point? What about my point of view? What about me? And that freedom says when you're set free, you're now free to do what? Free to go about the Father's business not free to make an opportunity because that grace that, you've, that you're taking advantage of brings great pain to the Holy Spirit. Amen? And 2 Corinthians 10.23 speaks to using your freedom as an opportunity. All things are lawful. That's the scripture I just spoke to you about. All things are lawful, but not all things are... Not all things are lawful. But not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but all, not all things do what? Right. So we're free. I love that. We're free to roam about the airplane. I love that. When that light goes off, ding, and it says, now you can get up and walk around. I love it. Right? That's what Jesus is saying. The seatbelt light is off. Get up. Ding, get up. Ding, get up. Amen? Amen. Love builds up. Love uses our freedom to serve others. Look at Galatians 13, the second part. But through love, there it is again, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. Love. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Let's not just rush over that. Love your neighbor 
as Tommy loves himself. It's hard to love others and see, and see God wanting good things and not looking at them and expecting perfection from others because we can't stand the imperfection in our own life. Jesus says, I want you free from that. I want you free from that. I want you to walk in that freedom. Amen? As followers of Jesus Christ, we have been given freedom from the law. Freedom from the big pointy finger, right? Freedom from the pain and the fear of displeasing the Father. You know, maybe you've been walking with the Lord a long time and it's just now kind of getting to you. I pray this morning you get it. Some of y'all put so much pressure on yourselves for perfection and it's painful. The Father God didn't save you to go back into the cage. It's for freedom that he set you free. And he set you free so you can love and serve others. So you can use that freedom to make a difference and not use that freedom for your own selfishness and sin. Amen? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes this morning? Lord, there are many this morning and in their hearts, they, there's a realization. There's a realization of John 8, 36, where Jesus says, if the Son sets you free, that you're free indeed. And you may be serving the Lord for many years. You may be walking with the Lord, or perhaps you're new in the Lord, or maybe you're just making, you're just making that journey, that beginning to assess Jesus and who he is. Understand that whether you're just seeking Jesus or you've been with him a, a little bit or a long time, realize that Papa God loves you. He loves you. I'm not saying that you don't get disappointed when you sin, when you mess up, and that Father God in his heart looks at you and goes, I have something better for you. And the pain that the Father feels when you fail and when you fall is so much different than a father that is waiting to beat you for the mistakes that you made, ready for you to spill the milk so he can backhand you. You know what I mean and what I'm talking about. Waiting for perfection of that report card to come in. Got to be perfect. Jesus is freeing you from that. He's freeing you from that false image of freedom. And he is saying, come to me, for I'm easy. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Woo! Come to me, my yoke, meaning if you attach yourself to me, you're going to find yourself lighter than you've ever felt before. You're going to experience genuine and true freedom in Jesus Christ. You're going to experience sin forgiven. You're going to experience a new life set before you as you walk with him. And for the older brother and older sisters, today in that parable of the prodigal, I want you to know that Jesus can set you free. Jesus, Jesus can set you free from that legalism, from the law, from that Judaizing mindset. He loves you. He loves you. Well, the Holy Spirit gets disappointed when we mess up. But hear me now. He loves you. That's not his go-to to beat you up. His go-to is that you be restored and refreshed. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I believe there are some young people here today. And it's been difficult for you. And you have put, you've drawn your own line in the sand and you've crossed over it so many times and you're frustrated and you think, how can, how can God love me? How can he put up with me and my mistakes? And, and, and I, I want you to know he loves you. He loves you. And he's calling you to him. Would you take that step to him? Set aside your expectations and your false image of the Father and just come to him. loves you. 
Father, this morning, as we leave this place, I pray that many would close the cages, that close their kennel door for the last time and walk away from it and have freedom, freedom to walk in love and service to you, freedom from the law, 